welcome back. In this lecture, we will discuss uh, limit phenomena, uh, specifically flammability limits and uh, quenching distance and we will also look at the phenomena of ignition. Uh, a couple of uh, simple relationship uh, relations that we uh, derived in uh, one of the earlier lectures connecting the reaction rate and uh, flame speed and flame thickness will be required for the discussions today. Uh, just to recall, uh, we derived this equation that the flame speed goes as 1 over rho u k by c p omega dot triple dash averaged square root and thickness of the flame or a measure of the thickness of the flame would be k over c p 1 divided by omega dot triple dash averaged square root. Combined this implies that SU delta over alpha is of order 1. Okay. We will need uh, these equations in today's lecture. So, what is uh, what are flammability limits? Uh, a good example to work with is uh, 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 domestic LPG flame. So, imagine lighting an LPG stove with a spark lighter. Unless you time the spark properly, the gas would not ignite. A few clicks at various locations around the burner leads to a flame. So, in this situation, uh, what is happening? So, the gas will ignite and the flame will stabilize provided the mixture that is exiting the burner, which is a mixture of LPG and air, is neither too lean which would be the case in the early stages when you open the valve nor too rich which would be the case when you wait too long to ignite. A similar situation can arise when there is a leak of gas into a room. In both these cases, the essential feature is that the gas mixture is flammable only over a range of mixture ratios. Too lean, it would not ignite. Too rich, it would not ignite. So, it has to be uh, within a certain range for it to ignite. So, this uh, these limits are the flammability limits. So, flammability limits are the range of fuel oxidant mixture ratios within which a flame can propagate and beyond which it cannot. These limits are determined by an experimental setup which is very similar to the flame tube arrangement a video of which uh, we saw in one of the earlier lectures. You have a long a uh, cylindrical tube of about 50 millimeters in diameter filled with uh, premixed mixture of uh, fuel and oxidizer. The experiment we saw was uh, in fact a mixture of LPG and air uh, of three different equivalence ratios lean, close to stoichiometric and rich. Ignition, uh, is, uh, ignition is done by a spark at one end and we saw a reaction front that propagates into the unburnt mixture. Uh, so, the experimental setup for determining the flammability limits are uh, essentially the same. Uh, so, by filling the tube uh, of diameter about 40 to 60 millimeters and about 500 millimeters in length with fuel oxidant combination of chosen mixture ratio, uh, propagation or uh, no propagation is checked by sparking at three locations, top, middle or bottom. Uh, the limits will depend on whether the ignition is at the top, middle or bottom. So, by this uh, experimental procedure, flammability limits have been experimentally determined for uh, a, a variety of fuel oxidizer mixtures. Let us take uh, methane air mixture for example. Uh, the flame speed as you can see in the uh, plot on the left hand side, the flame speed drops to a very low value of about 2 centimeters per second at 5 percent fuel on the lean side and also to about 2 centimeters per second at 15 percent fuel on the rich side. These values for fuel concentration are taken as the flammability limits of methane air mixture. So, it is 5 percent methane, 95 percent air on the lean side anything uh, fuel percentage lower than that a flame will not propagate. On the rich side it is 15 percent methane. 85% uh, air, more fuel 
it is a mixture that is richer than that the flame will not propagate. Remember that um, stoichiometric methane air mixture is about 9.5 percent methane and uh, rest is air ok. So, these values for fuel concentration are taken as the flammability limits of methane air mixtures. Note that the limits for hydrogen air are much larger than that of CH4 air. I would like uh, you to think about this question based on the uh, relationship between flame speed, reactivity and other properties that we discussed in the earlier lectures. Uh, an important fundamental question is under perfect adiabatic conditions, is no heat loss. Let us say in the hypothetical case where we are even able to exclude or prevent heat loss by radiation from the flame. The question is would there be limits to propagation or the would or would the propagation occur at all mixture strengths. The question that we are asking is, is the flammability limit simply a uh, consequence of the presence of heat losses in uh, real experimental setups. So, what is the role of heat losses in flammability limits? Calculations of uh, flame propagation show that a perfectly adiabatic flame should propagate at any mixture ratio, but in reality there are always heat losses. Even if we manage to prevent conductive heat losses, the irreducible heat loss due to radiation from the flame is always there. Okay. Heat loss in general has negligible influence on the flame speed around stoichiometry. Uh, for example, accounting for heat loss will change the flame speed at stoichiometric conditions by less than 2 percentage. But as the limits of flammability are approached, the influence becomes stronger due to relatively low heat release from combustion leading to quenching. By imposing heat loss mechanisms in calculations, it has been shown that the experimentally observed limits can be satisfactorily explained, indicating that that the observed uh, the experimentally observed flammable flammability limits are uh, sensitive to heat loss from the system. In this table uh, flammability limits are shown for some common fuel oxidizer combinations uh, the, at an initial pressure of 1 bar and uh, an initial temperature of 300 kelvins. Uh, we already saw uh, the case of uh, methane which is uh, uh, the lean limit is about 4.5 percent methane and the rich limit is 14 percent methane. Uh, an interesting hydrogen uh, we saw has wide uh, flammability limits, lean limit is 4 percent hydrogen, rich limit is 75 percent hydrogen. An interesting fuel is uh, acetylene, the lean limit is about 2.5 percent acetylene, the rich limit is 100 percent. This is because acetylene can exothermically decompose and form a flame even in the absence of air ok. So, questions uh, similar to uh, what we asked about flame speed can also be asked about flammability limits, what is the effect of initial temperature and what is the effect of initial pressure and so on. Uh, of course, higher initial temperatures enhance the limits, the dependence simply through the uh, change in the flame temperature and the reaction rate. Uh, lean limit seems insensitive to pressure, but rich limit is significantly enhanced at higher pressures. This is because of kinetic effects. Okay. Next, we will move on to the idea of quenching, which is simply an extension of flammability limits. Uh, the experimental setup that is used for measuring flammability limits is uh, as I described is a cylindrical tube of about 50 millimeters diameter and 500 millimeters in length. Uh, imagine conducting a test, uh, a flammability test with methane air mixture in such a tube. And uh, now if the tube diameter is reduced successively, what would happen? Uh, experiments indicate that up to about 20 millimeters. Uh, there is a significant change in the measured limits, but as the diameter goes below 20 millimeters, below this diameter, the limits begin approaching each other till a stage when the flame will not propagate at all at any mixture ratio. This critical diameter at which the flame, even a stoichiometric mixture cannot actually um, have a, a propagating flame is known as the quenching diameter and half of this value is called the quenching distance. 
So, what is the basis for the existence of such a limit? It is uh, simple as the diameter is reduced, the heat release rate due to combustion becomes inadequate to overcome the heat losses and this leads to quenching. So, the quenching diameter is uh, dependent on the flame speed, uh, maybe I will show uh, how this uh, comes about. We are looking at a uh, flame propagating in a tube, flame has a thickness of uh, delta, the tube diameter is d. Okay. So, heat release because of combustion we know is C p T f minus T 0 which is the enthalpy of the combustion which raises the temperature of the mixture from the initial temperature to the flame temperature multiplied by uh, <coughs> the uh, rate of the reaction multiplied by the volume of the reaction zone which is pi by 4 d squared times delta. Okay. So, this is the heat release because of chemical reactions. The heat loss is because of heat loss from the sides, okay. from the flame to uh, the walls and to the ambient. The heat loss is K dt dx, okay, which is approximately in this case K tf minus T0 over T by 2. This is the gradient in the radial direction. <coughs> so, the flame will quench, the flame will steadily propagate when heat release is much higher than the heat loss and in the limiting case when heat release becomes comparable to heat loss, the flame cannot propagate anymore because the heat that is released is not sufficient to sustain propagation. So, under these conditions we will have Cp T f minus T 0 delta is k. Uh, the term on the left hand side is as units of energy, the term on the right hand side has units of flux. So, I should multiply this by the area which would be pi d delta. Now, starting from here and making use of the relationship that we have already derived between flame speed and reaction rate, remember this and delta going as k by C p 1 over omega dot triple dash square root, make use of these two expressions to eliminate reaction rate and uh, delta from this equation, you will arrive at an expression that I have shown in the slides. So, quenching diameter is inversely proportional to the flame speed okay. and we already know that uh, we already know the pressure and the initial temperature dependence of flame speed. Uh, so, flame speed goes as uh, uh, flame speed is not very sensitive to pressure for uh, bimolecular reactions for most fuel oxidizer combinations the flame speed is insensitive to pressure and uh, the uh, density goes as 1 over pressure this gives a dependence that uh, goes like this the quenching diameter goes as pressure raised to minus n by 2 n is about 2. So, the quenching distance goes inversely as pressure and the dependence on temperature is through the 
Arrhenius term. So, the quenching diameter goes as exponential minus u over r, uh, twice RTF. Okay. So, n is typically uh, 2 pi molecular reactions and therefore, quenching distance goes as 1 over pressure. Let us uh, look at some typical values for the quenching distance. Uh, remember that more reactive the fuel is, higher is the flame speed and therefore, smaller is the quenching distance. So, we know that hydrogen air is uh, very reactive, is more reactive than methane air and a stoichiometric mixture of hydrogen air uh, has a quenching distance of, uh, distance of about half mm. Uh, hydrogen oxygen is more reactive than hydrogen air, the quenching distance is as small as 0.2 millimeters that is 200 micron. Okay. Methane air not so reactive, uh, the methane air is not, uh, not so reactive as a quenching diameter of about 2.5 millimeters. So, what is the use of flammability limits and quenching distance? Flammability limits are useful in identifying conditions which are favorable or unfavorable for ignition. We need favorable conditions for ignition for combustion applications where we want uh, a steady flame and uh, we do not need favorable conditions for ignition uh, when we want to prevent uh, combustion from happening like in fire scenarios, fire prevention scenarios. Another interesting application of flammability limits is in the design of gas generators for submarine surfacing. Uh, this is an interesting case study that is uh, a brief explanation of this is given in reference 1, where uh, a mixture of uh, uh, hydrazine and uh, uh, where hydrazine is used in the gas generator to actually uh, generate gases required for resurfacing of uh, fast resurfacing of submarines. Information about quenching distance is useful in designing gas lines carrying hydrogen air mixtures used in many uh, chemical industries. Uh, what is done in such places handling explosive mixtures is that uh, systems, various systems handling explosive mixtures are isolated by using a large number of parallel tubes of diameter less than the quenching distance. Therefore, even if there is ignition in one of these systems, the uh, flame is or the ignition is localized to that system and the fact that the pipes connecting these various systems have uh, a cross section that is smaller than the quenching distance, it will prevent the flame from propagating from one uh, block to the other block thereby localizing the ignition. Okay. So, that uh, concludes the discussion on flammability limits and quenching, let us move on to ignition. Ignition, uh, uh, the effort required for ignition is different uh, for gaseous liquid and solid fuels, this we know from uh, experience. So, the in terms of ease of ignition, it is uh, easiest to ignite gases or mixtures, reactive gaseous mixtures followed by liquids, followed by solids. Okay. Ignition implies what we mean when we say that something is ignited that a flame is established in the gas phase, a self sustaining flame is established in the gas phase and therefore, fuel vapors must be generated from liquids or solids for it to ignite. In the case of gaseous mixtures, we already have the fuel air mixture in the gaseous form, but in liquids and solids, energy must be provided to vaporize the liquid or decompose the solid to generate enough amounts of vapors for a gaseous flame to be established. Solids as we know are more difficult to vaporize compared to liquids and hence the most difficult to ignite. This even includes uh, very reactive fuels like rocket fuels, uh, enormous uh, amount of energy compared to gaseous fuels is required to ignite solid propellant rockets for example. A good example where an understanding of ignition is required is uh, the situation called relight of gas turbine combustion chambers used in aircraft. Uh, this is required after what is called flame out which is uh, usually caused when an aircraft goes through a region of heavy rain or uh, hail and a uh, lot of water or ice particles go into the engine uh, combustion chamber quenching the flame. Okay. Reliable relight is under these uh, very difficult conditions is mandatory for engine qualification and hence it is important to know 
uh, the criteria for ignition under such conditions uh, quantified in terms of ignition energy and where this energy must be provided. So, ignition methods the most common ignition method is the spark ignition uh, breakdown of resistance between electrodes due to high voltage uh, leads to formation of plasma ions and high energy species in this localized uh, zone. The local temperatures will also be very high. These reactive species diffuse away from the spark region recombine and generate heat leading to initiation of chemical reactions in the region around the spark. Uh, the energy of the spark must be sufficient to sustain the flame propagation. So, the spark energy determines whether these chemical reactions sustain or decay away. Uh, if the energy is uh, less than a critical value locally there will be ignition, but there would not be enough energy for the uh, flame to propagate and ignite the surrounding mixture and the entire process will get killed. Therefore, there is a certain minimum amount of energy that is required to make sure that whatever is ignited is sufficient to uh, sustain the process. We saw earlier in the context of quenching distance that when a flame kernel that is uh, uh, a piece of flame which will have a thickness equal to the flame thickness and with a cross section of at least the quenching diameter is generated that flame kernel can propagate on its own because the heat release within such a flame kernel is higher than the heat loss and therefore, propagation can uh, occur starting from that situation. If we create a flame kernel which has a diameter or a cross section that is smaller than the quenching distance losses or losses overcome the heat release and the propagation will cease. So, this simple criteria which we used uh, to derive the quenching distance can also be used to calculate the minimum ignition energy. That is exactly what is done here. The ignition energy is simply the energy that is required to create a flame kernel. Remember that the energy is the temperature should raise from uh, the initial temperature to the flame temperature and the corresponding volume should be equal to flame thickness okay, and a cross section that is at least the quenching diameter. Okay. So, this is the minimum ignition energy that is required for creating the flame okay. and uh, now again we earlier derived an expression for the quenching distance in terms of the flame speed and we already have an expression for the flame thickness in terms of reaction rate and flame speed and so on. So, what is done here is that the same equations that we used earlier are used to express the minimum ignition energy in terms of the flame speed. Remember that we expressed uh, the quenching distance in terms of the flame speed, here we are expressing the ignition energy also in terms of the flame speed. Okay. So, again the same dependences on pressure and initial temperature apply here and we know that flame speed goes as pressure raised to n by 2 minus 1, n is typically so, the flame speed is insensitive to pressure. There are exceptions, but this is uh, in general uh, is true. Density, the unburned gas density is directly proportional to pressure and the K by Cp is independent of pressure. Uh, this makes the minimum ignition energy go as 1 over P squared. This is a very strong dependence on pressure which must be recognized. Uh, the consequences of this is something that we will see in the next slide. So, this is a very steep dependence on pressure. So, by plugging in some typical values a thermal conductivity of 0 0.04 watts, watts per meter Kelvin, a delta T of 2000 Kelvins and a flame speed corresponding to a typical hydrocarbon air mixture about uh, 40 centimeters per second. We can calculate the minimum ignition energy to be about one tenth of a millijoule, it is 0.1 millijoule. Okay. All that I have done is uh, plugged in these numbers, plugged in the numbers that are given here into this formula okay, to calculate the minimum ignition energy which turns out to be 0.1 millijoule. It is a good number to remember, this is the minimum ignition energy required for igniting uh, a gaseous fuel air mixture. Some typical values are shown here, 
uh, hydrogen air is very low 0 0.01 millijoules, hydrogen oxygen is even lower, more reactive. Uh, methane air, uh, I think there is a, probably a mistake in the uh, numbers given here. This is this should be about 0 0.1 millijoule. Uh, I will check and uh, correct that, but the other numbers seem okay. Ethane is 0 0.4 millijoules, butane is 0 0.3 millijoules, and so on. That is typically the order of magnitude of the minimum ignition energy. What is important to recognize is that these <coughs> values are all calculated at 1 atmosphere and 300 kelvins and now imagine that you are uh, under conditions where uh, the pressure has decreased by a factor of 3 compared to the atmospheric pressure uh, like it would be in a flying aircraft which is flying at an altitude. So, the pressure has decreased by a factor of 3 remember that the ignition energy goes as 1 over pressure squared and therefore, now the ignition energy will go up by a factor of 10. So, 0 0.1 millijoules will now become 1 millijoule, it is a factor of 10 and more important to remember that in an actual engine the ignition uh, occurs or ignition should occur in the presence of a flow which is about 20 to 40 meters per second and in addition to this the fuel air mixture is not in a pre-prepared gaseous form what is injected as fuel is uh, fine droplets of kerosene which must vaporize form the fuel air mixture and ignite in the presence of air flow which is uh, 20 to 40 meters per second and at a pressure that is one third of the atmospheric pressure. All these additional things increase the minimum ignition energy required by a factor of about 1000. Uh, let me give you a break up here. Uh, gaseous mixture, uh, atmospheric pressure uh, 0.1 millijoules, gaseous mixture one third of the atmospheric pressure 10 times more that is 1 to 2 millijoule. Uh, introduction of a cross stream, introduction of air flow of 20 to 40 meters per second increases the ignition energy by a factor of 100 and the fact that the fuel is introduced as a liquid and not as a gas. Introduce an, introduces another factor of 10. Therefore, the total increase in ignition energy from this 1 to 2 millijoule is a factor of 1000. 100 for the flow, 10 for the vaporization energy required for converting liquid fuel into a gaseous fuel makes the typical ignition energies about 1 to 2 joules in uh, liquid fuel systems. Okay. Another ignition method that is used is the pilot flame. Uh, ignition method. Of course, pilot flame has lot more energy than a spark. Spark we saw is a few hundred millijoules to a few joules. Uh, a pilot flame will have a energy of about a few uh, 20 to 50 joules. A good reference is a matchstick, a matchstick flame this has about 20 to 50 joules of energy. But of course, we know that uh, under strong flow a spark is more stable compared to a pilot flame. But uh, it is not that uh, pilot flames are not used for larger systems like a rocket engine. What is done is a sort of a multi stage ignition where we use uh, where a spark is used to ignite a pilot flame and then the pilot flame uh, in turn is used for igni ignition of the main system. Uh, two examples are shown here one is a, a cryogenic engine a LOX H2 engine where a pilot flame is created by a spark a first a pilot flame is created by a spark and then more uh, by by introducing a small amount of fuel and oxidizer into the system first once the pilot flame is established more fuel and oxidizer are introduced into the system to establish steady conditions another interesting example is uh, a solid rocket engine where uh, igniter pellets or pyrotechnic compositions are ignited using an electric spark and the, the hot particles and hot gases generated by the burning of these igniter pellets in turn ignite the rest of the rocket. And these are done for small solid rocket motors for space boosters uh, what is done is a three stage ignition where we have an electrical input igniting the pyrotechnic uh, 
charge which will ignite a small rocket motor like the one that is shown here and this small rocket motor will actually go through the port of uh, the large rocket motor spewing hot uh, particles onto the surface of the propellant igniting the propellant. So, it is a rocket motor within a rocket motor. A uh, couple of ideas that uh, we need to uh, know to understand liquid fuel or appreciate liquid fuel ignition is the flash point and the fire point. Uh, flash point is the temperature of the liquid at which an ignition source can flash a flame. This is important to keep in mind that it will flash a flame and consume the vapors that were generated. But once you remove the ignition source, the flame will go away. Okay. So, this flame which is created at the flash point is not self supporting, it is there as long as you have the ignition source, you take the ignition source, the flame goes away. On the other hand, fire point is the temperature of the liquid at which the flame over the liquid pool becomes self supporting. The heat transfer here, you remove the ignition source, the heat transfer from the flame is sufficient to vaporize more fuel to keep the fuel pool burning. Well, uh, let me just add one more point on how uh, low energy solid fuels are ignited like coal or biomass. These uh, fuels are ignited by uh, sprinkling a small amount of liquid fuel on top of uh, these particles and igniting the liquid fuel. The liquid fuel, uh, the burning of the liquid fuel transfers heat, uh, sufficient heat to the surface of the solid fuel, thereby decomposing it and releasing vapors, which can establish a gaseous flame around the solid particles and uh, lead to self sustained burning of these particles. Uh, what is important to keep in mind is that the volatility of the liquid fuel that is used for ignition uh, should be such that, that uh, there must be sufficient heat transfer from the liquid fuel flame to the surface. You may have seen uh, videos of tricks where you can uh, douse uh, a dollar bill or a thousand rupee note bill in ethanol and you can burn it without burning the uh, note itself or the bill itself. That is simply because ethanol is so volatile that the vapors go off from the surface and burn sufficiently far away, not transferring enough heat back to the solid fuel or in this case a paper for it to ignite. So, it is important that, that the volatility is such that sufficient energy can be transferred back to the surface so that the solid fuel starts burning. So, in summary, we know that ignition is the first part of any combustion process. Energy needed for ignition is sensitive to initial pressure. Remember 1 over p squared. So, uh, the pressure goes down by a factor of 2, the ignition energy goes up by a factor of 4 and temperature. So, remember that it is very difficult to ignite at low pressures and low temperatures. Ignition delay which is the time from start of ignition to achieving close to steady state conditions should be small in combustion systems for effective ignition. This is a criteria that must be kept in mind while designing the ignition system. Quiescent re reactive gaseous mixtures require about 0.1 to 0.2 millijoules for ignition. This value goes up by orders of magnitude because of the following factors, introduction of a strong air flow and in, uh, introducing fuel in the form of liquids instead of uh, gases will increase this by a factor of Okay. So, the typical ignition energies required in a gas turbine engine is 1 to 2 joules. Liquids and solids must be heated up to a point where these fuels can give off enough vapors for ignition to occur. As I said, this increases the amount of energy required by a couple of orders of magnitude. That is about all that I have to uh, say about uh, flammability limits, quenching and ignition. These are important limit phenomena uh, required for designing of combustion systems ranging from domestic LPG stoves to rocket engines.